Why is Japanese customer service so amazing? Omotenashi, Japan's excellent customer service. Can I help you? Three ways the Japanese do customer service better. These are the titles of just a few videos I've seen online. And while I sort of agree that Japanese customer service is just amazing, there are some cases in which I would not really say that. And I'll tell you why, and then you can tell me if you agree with me or not in the comments. So several years ago, my friend went with a group of people to a restaurant, specifically an izakaya, which you can think of as like a Japanese pub. The group was doing an enkai kosu. Literally, that means something like banquet course or party course. It's like a set meal for a group of people and you pay per person and the food that you get is determined. Maybe all you can eat with a set menu, it depends. And they also added nomi hodai, which is all you can drink. And it was a two hour course, which means that you have two hours to eat all the stuff that is determined you can eat and drink as much as you want. And 30 minutes before it's over, you have to make your final order for drinks. And these are really fun if you get a chance to go with a good group. So I do recommend it. Everyone was having a great time in this group, you know, great atmosphere in the restaurant, great drinks, great food, and that just excellent Japanese customer service that you come to expect in Japan. You press the button at your table and a server shows up in three milliseconds and they take your order and they read it back to you and they get it right and they bring you your new drinks within, you know, 30 seconds. And it's just an overall great experience. And because my friend's group was having such a great time, they were pretty bummed when the server came and told them that their time was up, the two hours was over, and they had to leave. But the group looked around the izakaya and they noticed that they're the only persons in it. It was totally empty. So they had an idea. They asked the server, if we stay and just pay for anything extra that we order from now on, would it be okay to stay? The server went and checked with the management and then came back and said, yes, that's fine. You can stay and just pay for each individual item you order from here on out. Success. Everyone is happy. And while the group is going to order a new round of drinks, another server comes and starts picking up the half-eaten plates of food left over from the course. So my friend's group said, wait, well, don't take the plates because, you know, we're still eating that. And this is the moment when I think Japanese customer service sort of breaks down. So there is protocol. These are the words you say. This is how you say them. This is the uniform you wear and it looks like this and you wear it like this. And when you hand this item to the customer, you do it like this with two hands. And there's just a very clear cut system of the way that things are done. But what happens when a customer request breaks protocol? What do we do if it goes against the employee handbook, so to speak? In so many cases in Japan, in a situation like this, protocol is followed. Even if breaking protocol in this one particular situation would be mutually beneficial for both the restaurant and the customers. For example, if you own a restaurant and it's totally empty and a group of 10 people want to stay and keep paying you for more drinks, that's beneficial for you to keep them there. But the rule book says that after the two hour course is over, you clean up the plates and that food is done. So long story short, uh, protocol one in this situation and my friend's group left without ordering any new drinks and the restaurant let them leave without any more money. Now, I'm not saying this is you know bad customer service. I just don't think it's amazing. And if you spend enough time in Japan, you're going to encounter so many situations like this where you think, wait, if we just ignore the policy and the protocol for a few seconds and use our brains, everyone is going to be in a much better position at the end of this. But for better or worse, that's generally not the way things are done in Japan. And if you are in Japan and you run into a situation like this, uh, please try not to let it bother you too much. The phrase, the rules are made to be broken, doesn't apply very well in Japan. The rules are made to be followed. And these are all generalizations, by the way. Obviously, there's going to be exceptions in both directions because generalizations are generally true and anecdotally false. My first several years in Japan, I would sometimes get frustrated when things like this happen, but I don't really let it bother me anymore. Uh, instead, I like to think of customer service in Japan as like customer service on a first class international flight. The flight attendants are so polite and they seem to respond to your every little need at a moment's notice and often anticipate your needs and they have these very clean cut beautiful uniforms that they seem to take pride in just exquisite service but they're not going to serve you a drink during takeoff or landing yeah customer service is very important but the in-flight rules are more important that's just the way it is so i try to stick to protocol and follow the rules with everyone else i might not be thirty thousand feet in the air but i am in japan and they do have their own 
in-flight rules, so to speak. Well, what do you think? Does amazing customer service involve bending the rules every now and then to find a mutually beneficial outcome? Or does it rely more on just having great customer service protocols that are followed to the T? I'm mostly undecided. I mean, sometimes sticking to the policy and ignoring a customer's complaint or request is, I think, the right thing to do. For example, let's look at this Japanese interaction between a dissatisfied customer and a customer service employee. The following clip is taken from a YouTube video on how to deal with customer complaints. I thought this poor guy in the video was actually doing a pretty good job, but the expert, so to speak, uh, was super critical of his performance. So I'll play it and then I'll explain it and then you can decide whether or not he does a good job. Oh, and if you're studying with Native Shark, uh, which I'm helping to build, I think you should probably be able to understand two thirds of this conversation if you're around milestone, I don't know, eight or nine, and probably 100% of it if you're further along, you know, maybe in like the 20s or 30s. All right, let's dive in. So, excuse me, I bought this curry here yesterday, but it's not good at all, so please give me a refund. She starts with すいません, excuse me. Note that she says すいません, not すみません. In speech, it's very common to say すいません, which is just a less proper form of saying すみません, which is a way to say excuse me. Kino, yesterday, koko, here. De is a particle that can mark the location where an action is done. So we know that she's about to tell us an action that was done here yesterday. Kata, bought, kare, curry. And specifically, she's referring to pre made packaged curry that you prepare at home. And this is all a noun phrase, by the way. Kino, koko de kata kare, the curry I bought here yesterday. Uh, in Japanese, noun phrases end with the noun, which is why the words are reversed in English. So yesterday, here, de bought curry becomes the curry I bought here yesterday. Those are both noun phrases and the words are just in opposite order. And next she tells him something about this kare. She says, So that means wasn't good at all. Oishi means tasty or delicious. And to put it in the negative form, you just drop off that final e and replace it with kunai. So oishi, oish, oish kunai, not tasty, not delicious. And zenzen means something like totally or not at all. Uh, so not at all, not delicious at all. Zenzen oishikunai. And then at the end of that, she says, ndakedo. So kedo, you can think of as a content marker. It indicates that there's more to be said after this. Sometimes it gets translated as but, and sometimes that's a good translation and sometimes not. It just means there's, she's got more to say after this. And that nda part, ndakedo is, you can think of it as an explanation marker. It's just very hard to explain succinctly in a video like this, but she's explaining something. And we know that that is the case because she uses nda. And this is the kind of thing you'll just pick up from vibes and hearing the language enough in enough situations. But yeah, she uses ndakedo because, because what she said was a reason and then there's something else coming next. And what's coming next is the point of why she's saying this, which is Please give me a refund. Literally, okane is money. And then the verb kaisu means to return or to give back. And if you put that in te form, it's kaishite, give back return. And you put kudasai onto the end of it. It is a formal request, kaishite kudasai, please return, please give back. So okane kaishite kudasai is please give me a refund. So now we've got all the parts, right? Suimasen is excuse me. And then kino koko de katta kare the curry I bought here yesterday, zenzen oishikunai ndakedo, was not at all delicious, or is not at all delicious. Okane kaishite kudasai, please give me my money back. Excuse me, I bought this curry here yesterday, but it's not good at all, so please give me a refund. That's a tough customer to deal with, but luckily this guy has a classic weapon in his arsenal, company policy. He starts with, which is just a very formal way to say, I'm sorry, sorry, you should learn it as a set phrase. And then he says, So, is something like merchandise or goods that are being sold. And the verb is an honorific verb meaning to eat 
the normal verb for to eat is just taberu, but you would use this honorific verb instead, meshiagaru, when you're talking about someone who is highly respected or honored, like a customer. So you don't describe a customer eating with the verb taberu, you describe a customer eating with the verb meshiagaru. And he puts that in the past tense, so meshiagatta, honorably ate. And then that is the first part of the noun phrase, meshiagatta shohin. So merchandise that was honorably eaten. <laughs> Then he says nitaishite, which in a phrase like this means to or toward. Uh, he uses nitaishite because he's about to describe the company's policy toward uh, merchandise that has been eaten. Then wa, a topic marking particle. So in a quasi literal translation, meshiagatta shohi nitaishite wa means something like, as for our policy toward merchandise that has been consumed, and then he tells her what that policy is, henpin dekinai koto ni natte Returns are not permitted. Henpin suru means to return, like an item that you bought. Did you notice that the first kanji in this word is the same as the kanji in the verb kaise, to return, to give back? That makes sense because this kanji means something like return or give back. Only in this word it's paired with a kanji that looks like three boxes stacked up on top of each other. And that is a kanji that means something like goods because it's goods in three packages that are stacked up is how I think of it. And that is the same kanji we saw in shohin, uh, merchandise. Only the first kanji in that one is something like selling goods or dealing in. So dealing in goods, merchandise. I didn't really need to mention that. I just think kanji are pretty fun when they kind of all fall together like this so nicely. So yeah, henpin suru means to return something. Suru is a verb that means to do and we can put it in its potential form, dekiju, to be able to do, which is what he does. So henpin dekiru means to be able to return, only he says that the negative version of this, henpin dekinai, not able to return. And then he makes that into a noun by putting koto onto the end of it. So, henpin dekinai koto, not being able to return. Then he uses the phrase ni natte orimasu to describe that this is just the way things are, the way they've been decided. Ni naru, literally to become, is often used to describe a situation that has ended up a certain way. It's not like he personally decided that she can't return an opened item. It's just that's what was is decided, you know, officially. Since he's describing the ongoing state, the the state of which the rules are, uh, he puts ninaru into the viteiru form, which would be ninateiru. And if you conjugated that, it would be ninateimasu. This nani nani koto ninateimasu is sort of a set phrase, and sometimes I see it being taught as JLPT N2 grammar. We actually have a lesson on it in Native Shark, so I'll just show it to you. Stating expectations with koto ninateiru. Koto ninateiru can be used to describe an established way that things are expected to be done as opposed to just something you decided on your own. We can scroll down, for example, and your friend came to visit you at the hospital and brought beer as a gift, and then you say... Yeah, so... So, means... Must not drink. That's a different grammar pattern we could cover elsewhere. And then, and at the end of that, he's putting koto ni natteru. So it literally is becoming, but it's just that's the what that's the rules. That's the way it is. I appreciate the thought, but we're not supposed to have alcohol in here. That we're not supposed to is just it's just the way things are. But in our conversation, he didn't say henpin dekinai koto ni natteimas or henpin dekinai koto ni natteru. He says henpin dekinai koto ni natte orimas. That orimas is so te orimas is a humble form of teiju, and he's using humble form because he's a customer service employee describing the actions of him or his company, like his his group, they're humble. This is pretty quintessential Japanese customer service in my opinion, you know, this is the policy and uh, we're gonna follow it and, you know, sorry, but that's the policy. And he relays all this information while using honorific language for the customer and humble language for himself and the company. And I don't want this conversation to run too long, but I will tell you the last thing she says, which is... <laughs> that first part, I didn't know how to just how to, how to transcribe. <laughs> like that just noise that she's making to be like, hold on a second. And then demo is but... And then we've already seen zenzen oishikunai, only here she puts it in past tense. So instead of zenzen oishikunai, she gets rid of that e at the, e at the end and says zenzen oishikunakata was not, so it's past tense, was not at all delicious. And then she puts no at the end because she's a feminine speaker and that's the feminine version of the nda, that explanation marker. So she's explaining, yeah, but it wasn't good at all. And that's my explanation for why you should be giving me a refund. Okay, so that's the whole segment of the clip. Uh, let's play the whole thing and see how much you can catch now that I've gone through it bit by bit. 
全然おいしくないんだけどお金返してください申し訳ございません召し上がった商品に対しては返品できないことになっておりますええー、でも全然おいしくなかったの So, what do you think? Is he doing a good job? Was the server at the restaurant my friend went to with that group doing a good job? Or would you have done something differently? What do you think is amazing customer service? Finally, I do have to mention that while this policy driven approach to customer service in Japan does frustrate me at times, Japan is probably my favorite country when it comes to customer service, and there are certainly things in the US that frustrate me a lot more. But that's a video for a totally different channel. Thank you for watching this video. Thank you for your time. この番組はフューチャーラーニングメソッドネイティブシャークがお送りしました。